Well, welcome to another video. Justin Davey here. Um, a lot of the videos on my channel recently have been me talking about uh, lenses and cameras and bits and pieces like that. Um, and I thought it might be quite useful to talk a bit more about what I do primarily um, and as well as working in broadcast and doing broadcast training uh, for the last blimey 13 14 years I've been involved in higher education lecturing and my main subjects have been uh, AV technology um, so I thought I might do a little video just a very basic chalk and talk lecture if you like on a few different topics and the topic for today is dynamics processing okay so dynamics processing this is a bit weird writing on a whiteboard on a desk rather than on a wall so dynamics processing what is it okay now something that students often get mistaken with is when they talk about dynamics processing they often talk about frequency now yes you can get frequency dependent dynamics processors but when most people talk about frequency when they're talking about dynamics processing they actually mean level that is what they really mean I've marked countless exam papers on this kind of topic and, and it always amazes me the amount of people who, who talk about frequency but they don't mean frequency frequency and we'll do another lecture on frequency one day is to do with cycles per second so is to do with effectively a waveform and basically how many of these oscillations basically when there is a repetition of point to point how many of these happen every second that is frequency and that's measured in hertz note capital h small z okay because it was named after mr hertz okay so frequency is to do with cycles per second or hertz nothing to do with level and dynamics processing certainly with a single band dynamics processing dynamics processor sorry is to do with level now if you can get a reasonable comprehension of what dynamics processing is and what a dynamics processor does you will get a lot better sounding audio so this is a very quick overview of what a compressor uh, what a dynamics processor is there are essentially in the family of dynamics processors there are four different kinds there is the compressor probably the most common and that's probably what we'll concentrate mostly on today there is the gate there is the expander and there is the limiter okay four different things associated with the dynamics processor family now notice also the word processor because processor I would certainly argue that if something is a processor it is affecting affecting not affecting the entire signal that goes through it so often this kind of device would be patched into a desk or through software via an insert connection and that enables the entire signal to pass through the compressor that does something to it and then the entire signal comes out again an effect with an e has what you would normally refer to as a wet and dry ratio between the clean dry signal and the wet affected signal uh, so an effect I would say with an E is something like a reverb which is where you are adding some of the wet affected signal and adding it to or mixing it with the original dry signal a processor such as a dynamics processor is something that affects a the entire signal okay so let's pick probably the most common 
certainly the one that's probably the most useful to understand to begin with, and that's the compressor. Okay, so what does a compressor do? Now, yes, it sprays cars or blows air, but in terms of audio, what does the compressor do? Right, a compressor is all to do with affecting or reducing or changing the dynamic range of your signal. Now, what's dynamic range? You can always fast forward through this if I'm getting boring. What is dynamic range? Essentially, dynamic range, if you've got a signal, let's say you've got a signal coming in here and it's got some loud bits and it's got some medium bits, it's got some really loud bits and it's got some soft bits. The dynamic range of our signal is essentially the range in dB between the highest and the lowest signal. And that would be our dynamic range. Okay, usually, like I say, in dB. Hey, dB, notice small d, big B. The amount of times I see big D, small b, or big D, big B, it's small d, big B. Okay, so dynamic range is the range in dB between the highest and the lowest level of the signal. So this would be time across this axis. This is how the level of the incoming signal changes with respect to time usually in seconds. And this is our amplitude, okay? A for amplitude in dB. Now we'll talk about dB later on. There might be some people going, oh, well, you, what kind of dB is it? Effect, that's absolutely right. There's lots of different kinds of decibels. That's dimensionless as, at the moment because there's no reference unit. But essentially, I'm just gonna keep it simple and say it's dB for now. I hope you can see this, okay? I'm trying to monitor this on my Atomus at the same time. Okay, so that's dynamic range. Now, when you record something, you want to record, certainly this is very important in the digital domain, you've got to obviously set your levels such that you don't go past zero. Zero what? Well, in the digital domain, we're talking about zero dBFS, which is full scale. So when you set your recording, and this applies to the Sony A7S that I'm using, it applies to uh, Pro Tools, it applies to any digital audio device, video cameras, whatever. When you record your incoming signal, you set your gain so that nowhere, ideally, does your incoming signal hit zero dB full scale. Okay, so imagine you've got a situation when you're recording something and you know at some point of your scene, of your film or your vocalist in a recording studio, or whatever it might be, imagine that that, you know that there's a certain bit that's going to be really, really loud, okay? So obviously when you set your gain in the studio or on your camera, what you would normally do is get your, you know, your commentator, if it's in live OB or your talent in front of the camera or whatever, to say that line, or speak at the loudest level they're going to be speaking at. And then you would set your gain accordingly. So imagine you've got your incoming signal here, same as last time, amplitude with respect to time. Let's say most of the time your gain is down here. So they're talking nicely and then you come to that really loud bit and you've allowed sufficient gain to cater for that. This bit here, oh look, I've got a different colored pen here. Bear with me. Let me get my, excuse me, red pen. So this bit here, look, wants to be around, now you even so, you, you always want to allow a bit more headroom, but let's say you've set that so that that's peaking at about, I don't know, minus six dBFS. Okay? The rest of this signal lot, the average level, is really, really quite small. And that might be peaking at, I don't know, let's say we're hitting minus 20. Now, we could go into the difference between 
oh, excuse my phone there, uh, the difference between 16-bit and 20-bit and 24-bit recordings. And yes, there's an argument to say that you can have a lot more headroom when you've got more bits, if you like. But let's assume that we're dealing with 16-bit, so we want to be fairly close to 0 dB full scale. Most of the time, our level's pretty low. Now, when you're trying to mix that with other things, obviously the diction can be lost because you've got some really quiet bits to allow for this really loud bit and then really quiet bits again. So what we want is something that will enable us to still get the timbre, the quality of the louder part, because obviously someone can't shout quietly. So we want them to be able to shout. We want that instrument to, you know, we want a saxophone to be blown really hard to get that certain timbre. But we also want a more even dynamic recording. So that's where the compressor comes in. So let's have a look at what the compressor does. So if we take um, uh, a very simple diagram of what's inside a compressor, you've got your incoming signal. Okay, here's my signal. Uh, there we go, coming into my compressor. And then it goes through, actually, it will go through some kind of amplifier. Okay. And this is a very simple. And that might be a VCA, which is voltage controlled amplifier, or it could be an optical device which uses something like a light dependent resistor to, con to control the level of the signal. Uh, but we're going to talk about a electronic, a purely kind of VCA, solid state based system. So this is my VCA voltage controlled amplifier. So a signal comes in and obviously it goes out. And we might have another amplifier there for makeup gain. The signal then is tapped off here. And bear in mind this is AC here. This responds to a DC signal. Now I'm not going to talk about the difference between AC and DC here. You can find that for yourself. Let me just move my board down a touch. But it's rectified. Now what does a rectifier do? Well, a rectifier basically turns an AC signal into a DC signal. So basically, a signal's come in. It's been tapped off. And this is often called our side chain. If I can write small enough. Okay. So once it's rectified, it will go through some kind of comparator circuit. Now, what does a comparator do? Well, simply, oh no, my drawing's not going to be long enough. Comparator. Okay, it's going to go through a comparator. Now, a comparator circuit, and you can design all sorts of different kind of comparator circuits. So essentially, what a comparator circuit does is it says, okay, is the incoming signal higher or lower or equal to a reference signal? So what we have on our compressor as well is something called a threshold. Now, I often say to my students that a good analogy for a threshold is a tripwire. So imagine you are six foot and you're walking through a six foot six doorway, what's going to happen? Nothing. You'll get through the door frame. But as you lower the door frame or you lower that tripwire attached to the door frame, the more of your head is going to get chopped off as you try and walk through. And that's essentially what a threshold does. So this is a threshold signal level. So what the threshold does, it says, OK, let's say my threshold is set to, let's keep it nice and easy, minus 20 dB FS. So the signal comes in and let's say it's minus 30 dBFS, which is smaller. Remember, we're dealing with negative numbers here. So in, di in the digital world, you're always talking negatively with the maximum signal level, as I mentioned earlier, being zero dBFS. So we've got an incoming signal at minus 30. Um, the threshold is set to minus 20. So nothing comes out. And basically the signal passes through uh, and the input equals the output. But when the signal goes over that tripwire or the threshold control, what will happen is it goes, OK, my signal's now minus 10. Oh, no, the threshold's minus 20, which means the threshold is smaller than the incoming signal. So this then outputs a signal, a DC control signal to the VCA, which says, hey, up a minute, turn down the level of that gain. This is a makeup gain amplifier. 
Now that's, we'll talk about that shortly. But essentially that's what's happening. There's various other things on this side chain. Um, you'll have attack and release, and we'll talk about those in a minute, but there'll be attack and release controls on that side chain. But essentially the signal comes in, is it higher than the threshold? Yes, right, do something to this amplifier and turn it down. So let's have a look at what that looks like in the real world. I'm going to need a wet cloth. So let's, let's say we've got our incoming signal, uh, like before, so small bits, loud bits, small bits, okay. We go through the compressor and let's say our threshold is set such that we don't want to affect these quiet bits because they're already quiet. We just want to start affecting these peaks. So we're going to set our threshold somewhere around here. Then what we have on the uh, compressor is another control called ratio. Now let's just deviate from this diagram here a minute and talk about what ratio does. Another kind of diagram, input versus output level. So rather than time versus amplitude, let's have uh, uh, output level here and input level here. So essentially, if you've got no compression, you have a straight line graph with a, with a gradient of one to one. Because whatever comes in, sorry, that's the wrong way around. I knew I'd get that wrong. Let's swap that around to make this more easy. That's output and that's input. Okay, so imagine you've got uh, no compression taking place. Let's say a signal comes in here at say minus 10 dBFS. It comes in at minus 10. Hey, hey, it goes out at minus 10. No compression. But let's say we've got a different situation like we talked about a minute ago, and we've got our threshold set to minus 20. Okay, so there's our straight line graph assuming no compression is taking place. We've set our threshold at minus 20. Now, once that signal goes over minus 20, we need to tell the compressor to do something. Otherwise, nothing's gonna happen. And that's where our ratio control comes in. Now, the ratio determines the amount of compression or the amount of attenuation, if you like, that takes place once the incoming signal has exceeded the threshold level. So, let's say an incoming signal comes in at uh, let's say, uh, let's say our incoming signal comes in at minus 10. So we've got a threshold of minus 20 and an incoming signal comes in at minus 10. Okay, so it's exceeded the threshold. Now it's exceeded this threshold by 10 dB. Yeah, so the threshold was minus 20, the incoming signal was minus 10, so it's gone over the threshold by 10 dB. Just the same as if my threshold was six foot and I was six foot six, I'd gone over that threshold by six inches. So what happens now? Well, the ratio control determines the amount of attenuation, as I said. So let's keep it very simple. And let's say we've got, let me choose a different pen. Let's say we've got a ratio of two to one. So instead of being, that's one to one. Oh, that's not very good. You can see that. Let's go back to black. So that's one to one. No gain, no attenuation, unity gain, what comes in goes out. Now, once the signal goes over the threshold here, two to one will look like this. So what does that mean? Well, the signal has exceeded the threshold by 10 dB. So even though it's come in, at 10 dB over the threshold, it's now only going out at this level. Now, how much is that? Well, very easy. It's gone over the threshold by 10 dB. The ratio is two to one, which basically means for every two dB change over that threshold, only one dB will allow to, um, 
be output of the device. So essentially that's going to go out not at minus 10 anymore, it's going to go out at minus 15. Why is that? Well, 10 dB over the threshold, 2 to 1, so it's only going to be 5 dB over the threshold. You could say 5 to 1. What would 5 to 1 be? Well, 5 to 1 might look like that, which basically means for every 5 dB increase, we're only going to go out by 1. So this has gone over by 10 dB, which effectively means it's only going to be allowed out at 2 dB over the threshold. Now, what's that? Well, 2 dB higher than minus 20 is minus 18. So rather than going out at minus 10, because that's what the, in remember the incoming came in at minus 10, instead of going out at minus 10, with a ratio of 5 to 1 and a threshold of minus 20, it will only be allowed out at minus 18. Well, why do we want to do that, you might ask? Well, going back to our previous drawings, we've got our incoming signal here, we've got our threshold set, and let's say we've got 5 to 1 ratio. So what's that signal going to look like? Well, it's now going to look like, well, try and do this as accurate as possible, nothing's happening at the beginning, but once we go over this threshold lot, these peaks are going to be turned down. So they're going to look more like this, and then unaffected. Now, what's that achieved? Well, if we assume that, say, this line here and this line here is, let's, let's pretend it's very extreme, so we just set this gain correctly. Let's say this is 0 dBFS. We've now got on this bit a nice bit of extra headroom, which means... Going back to that other diagram, if you remember I mentioned, once it goes through the voltage controlled amplifier, we've got that makeup gain amplifier. What we can now do is increase the overall level of the entire signal. We couldn't do that before because if we did, the, this would exceed 0 dBFS. And what does that, that look like? Well, effectively, it looks like a square line. And that's going to introduce all sorts of distortion and clipping and nastiness. So we can't, we couldn't introduce, we couldn't increase the gain anymore there, but now we can. So we end up with a signal after it's been compressed and gone through that makeup gain where everything is now louder, something like that. And we're back up to that maximum level. Not a very accurate drawing, I know, but you get the idea. So what we've done with the compressor is we've used the threshold and the ratio to squash the dynamic range, the range between the loudest part and the quietest part, so that we have now can fit it into a smaller window, if you like, and then here we can increase the entire level up to give a more even dynamic range and a more even sounding level. Now that will mean it's easier to mix. If you're doing a voiceover over some background noise, it's going to make it more consistent and more even. And that's a basic compressor. As I said earlier, there are a couple of other controls you should be familiar with, and that's attack. Or what is attack? Well, basically, attack is the time it takes for the compressor to kick in. So sometimes you would have a slow attack if you wanted to capture the. You know, a good example might be a snare drum. When you've got the initial sound of the snare, what you might want to do is for the first millisecond, few milliseconds, is have the uncompressed signal unaffected. Does that make sense? Have the signal unaffected. And then the compressor kicks in to control the decay of the sound. That's not really using a compressor for dynamics control. That's actually more to do with changing the timbre of the sound of the instrument. But with a dynamics compressor, what we're doing is looking at trying to maintain a more even average sounding signal. And hopefully that should enable you to capture the nuances of, of different signal levels, not getting your performer to deliberately sing or speak more quietly. Get the actual recording you want when, with them screaming or whispering or shouting or whatever, but then use the compressor to control the level. Essentially all a compressor is really is someone doing that on the fader all the time. 
and kind of what we call riding the fader. But it's automatically monitoring that incoming signal. Has it exceeded the threshold? Yes, it has. Let's turn the level down um, as determined by the ratio. The other three I'm not going to go into now, but essentially the noise gate is an automatic muting control, if you like. So once that doesn't apply any compression, but what it does is once the signal falls below a threshold, it turns it off completely. So that's quite useful if you're doing a voiceover and say you, you've got some pages rustling between pauses and you want to mute them. Um, the other one is a limiter, which is an extreme version of the compressor, usually with a ratio of 50 to 1, maybe 20 to 1, depending which textbook you read. Um, that's very that's like a brick wall. So no matter how loud that incoming signal gets, it's not going to be allowed out any louder at all. And the other one was the expander. And the expander is a softer version of the noise gate. So it's a little bit more gentle. It kind of closes more slowly, if you like, rather than as soon as the signal goes below a certain threshold, muting it all together, it kind of just gently turns it off. So it can be a bit more natural sounding. So the compressor is uh, a dynamics processor. It affects the entire signal. You can get frequency dependent compressors, so you can compress different frequency bands differently. But in this example, we we're just talking about compressing the entire signal by the same amount. You have your threshold, which is your tripwire control. You have your ratio, which is how much do you want the signal to be attenuated by once it exceeds the threshold. You have the attack and the release. Oh, I didn't say what release was. Okay, so the attack was the time it takes the compressor to kick in. The release is the time it takes the compressor to, to kind of die away, if you like, or return to, to within probably about 4 dB of its final value. A slow release will be much more natural. A quick release, you're going to have sometimes called pumping or breathing, where you can hear the background level going up and down straight away. If you set your release time to say three or four seconds and you're doing a voiceover, then as long as your pauses aren't longer than three or four seconds, your compressor is always going to be compressing, if you like, and it's going to sound a lot more even and a lot more natural. So I hope that was interesting. Please comment, please subscribe. Um, I think I'll talk about EQ next, and I think I may also do a bit of an introduction to decibels for dummies. And we'll talk about gain, we'll talk about signal levels such as the dBU and the dBV. We'll talk a bit more about manipulation of signal levels. And we might do a little bit of logarithms as well. So I hope that was useful, and I'll see you later. Thanks for watching.